This is the Black Experience for all. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Welcome to the Black Experience. I'm honored to have Vicki Vasquez, owner and chairwoman of the Board of Tribal Tech, an American Indian woman-owned small business. Tribal Tech collaborates with federal agencies and tribes to improve security, health, education, energy, and environmental services. Vicki, I just wanted to say thank you very much for, for being a part of this. Um, you know, part of what we try to do with the Black Experience for All is is try to sh- you know share successful stories of people of color uh, to help inspire young people and to help eliminate racism. So it's an absolute yes. honor and privilege to get a chance to chat with you. And I know how busy you are, so I won't keep you long. So it's okay. So if it's okay, could we maybe we can get started with what I'd like to do is I always like to ask about sort of I, I don't you don't have to tell me when, but sort of where when and where you were born and sort of the role of uh, your parents and grandparents as you know the way they influenced you growing up. Sure. Well, I'm going to start with. Um, uh, my parents, having met, my father was in the uh, military. He was in Fort Campbell, Kentucky, and he's native. And my mother, who is from uh, Goodlettsville, Tennessee, okay. uh, outside of Nashville, and she met him a very young age when he was in the service. And he immediately uh, married her and took her to Southern California. Her grandparents, I mean, her parents, I'm sorry, my grandparents were not thrilled. Uh, They thought California not only was earthquakes, uh, the nuts and crazy people, um, it just was a little far off from uh, Goodlettsville, Tennessee. But my mother went, never looked back, and we were raised in uh, uh, Southern California. My father, like I said, is Native, and he is... uh, former tribal chairman of the San Pasqual Band of Mission Indians, okay. uh, Degania, which is outside of uh, San Diego, uh, further inland. And my mother, who is German and Scottish. Uh, so we fortunately got the color of our father and the good skin, uh, which I appreciate yes. as I get older. <laughs> and uh, like I said, he was the chairman. He, My father and mother have passed. and. Growing up in uh, Southern California, I truly, as a child, um, didn't know the difference between a reservation and where we grew up in Fountain Valley, California. I just thought when we'd go down to the reservation that we were visiting my aunties, my uncles, my cousins, and didn't know they were on some particular reservation land until I got much older. Okay. I think because, and I, I don't think we're seeing that today, but certainly back then, um, assimilation was more important to my father. He, so he thought um, that we needed to all fit in, be a part of the same uh, environment, and yet we weren't. Um, but that uh, assimilation is pretty much where I was headed until uh, college when I realized my father was tribal chairman of our tribe and I'm American Indian and I never really felt I was any different than anyone else maybe my color but uh, growing up I think in Southern California helped versus uh, growing up in Tennessee. <laughs> okay. So I'm curious what what year were your parents born, Vicky? My father was let's see I think one was 31 and one was 33. My father was 1931. My mother was 1933. So that's, uh, that's the year they were born. Yep. Okay. Yep. So, so I'm this not is, gonna tell you my year. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> fine. No, that's fine. So so basically we're talking like 62, 63, 64 in that time period when they got married. Uh they got married, no, uh probably in my, I'd say the early 50s. Early 50s. Okay. All right. Yeah. I think they both were like 2022. 20, okay. So um, I'm curious, yeah. just in talking about your dad, and you, you talk about your dad and assimilation, um, did he ever recount sort of what life was like for him growing up uh, as a, uh, a Native American? 
Well, you know, my dad, my grandmother on his side, who who passed when we were very young, um, had married many times. Um, and so his brothers have the same mother, but different fathers, but they were as close as if they were from the same genes. You know, they he had five brothers, very close. And so they really didn't have much. And part of their time was in on the reservation in Valley Center, California, mm -hmm. and somewhere in Anaheim, California. She kind of went back and forth, his mother. But okay. um, he he only spoke when he was uh, in the Kentucky, Tennessee area, um, because at that time in the 50s, early 50s, when he left the military, it was um, the blacks were allowed on the bus, but the Indians weren't allowed on the bus. Mm -hmm. There was a black uh, fountain for you to drink from the white fountain, where you, and there was no Indian uh, American Indian fountain per se. Mm -hmm. So he said there was more he felt from that part of the country, certainly, than he did in Southern California. Interesting. Okay. So yeah. Talk, he was talk, in the uh, 101st Airborne uh, okay. when he served. All right. And do you, do you know, did he serve overseas, Vicki? He did. Um, Korea, uh, I think, was the. I'm I'm not sure. It was in the okay. later part. It wasn't World War One, World War Two, any of that. Um, it was Korea. But, okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, thank you. And he a little side bit for my father. He was a boxer. He was hmm. very small, so it was like the featherweight or okay lightweight. It was a, the and we've got pictures of him from back then. So he was able to get a little bit out of some of the action in the military because he represented them in the boxing world. Okay. No, th no thank you. Thank you for sharing that. So yeah. you talked about growing up and you, you would go to the reservation and in, in, in essence, you know, you look back or at that time it was uh, going to visit aunts and uncles and so on. But do you recall, was there anything unique or stark or very different about the reservation now that you look back on it, Vicki? Well, I can tell you, uh, my dad, uh, back in the day, if I can say it, that's what my daughter always says, back in the day, um, he started the first education program on the reservation. Okay. And that was long before casinos and hotels and the hospitality uh, industry started. And I'm always proud to say that my dad started that. Um, not that I'm against gambling and, and hotel. I, you know, I'm the first one to go stay in a hotel and have fun. But um, I'm just so proud he, he felt the need for education, yes. which obviously springboarded me into my passion uh, of going into teaching initially when I first started my education. So you went to college uh, and yeah, where did you go, Vicki? I went. I uh, went to a small uh, private school in San Diego first, which no longer exists. And then all of us had to scramble to go somewhere. And I decided to go to Cal State University at Fullerton. Okay. And um, back then versus today, these kids today, I don't know how they do it, but I think all I had to do was sign my name and pay a small amount, and I got to go to college. And yes. Yes. We, I was first generation. Okay. Uh, you know, my brother, my sister, and I uh, to go to college. I, my father was on a mission to make sure we all went to college. That's fantastic. And then I did my graduate work at UC Irvine, okay. uh, where I mentioned I uh, wanted to be a school teacher. And so I went into teaching initially before I came back east. So at that time, when you identified yourself as a Native American, any reaction? Pros, cons? Uh, I didn't really have feel any uh, like negativity or any racism or anything like that when I was in college. As a matter of fact, I started, I was one of the individuals that started a Native American program at Cal State Fullerton. Okay. And um, 
we were pretty much an activist organization, to be honest with you, which I'm not today. <laughs> but um, we brought in uh, some folks uh, back then, um, Marlon Brando, uh, uh, Russell Means, Dennis Banks. And if you Google those folks, they were uh-huh. part of the American Indian movement was a pretty radical group. Yes. And I did that. And that's when someone asked me, what is something people don't know about you? When I tell them that they're like, big eye, like, <laughs> we did that. But in our organization, oh. we not only had Indian people, you know, American Indian people, we had non-Native people join our group. And we were, you didn't really see color. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I have to attest that to my, my parents. Uh, you know, it was a testament to them, in in my opinion, because mm-hmm. uh, I think you learn you learn that growing up from your parents or yes. your grandparents yeah. um, versus becoming it. You know, you, you you're going to become it if you grow up with someone that's racist. So, I was very fortunate. My my parents were you, they either liked you or they didn't like you, not because of your color or your wealth. Um, so what was uh you talk about Marlon Brando and Russell Meads? Yeah, th- those are two big names, two heady names. Uh-huh. What was uh-huh. uh do you recall what that was like meeting them? Well, um actually we we had De- uh Dennis Banks, uh Russell Means and Vernon Belcourt, that was the other one, come to the school first. Yeah. And then I was a driver, I had a van, I was really cool, I had a van. And so I was the driver, and we took them to Mulholland Drive to Marlon Brando's home which was very dark when we got in. And back then you had the cameras that you opened them and you could put film in and then you sure. close them. Yes. You'd have to go get it developed. <laughs> well, we all were, you know, just like mesmerized. There's my Brando. Now what the conversation was, I have no idea, but I know it was during the time when Marlon Brando had the native woman accept his award and there was a lot of going on of representing Indian people and so we were just proud to be in the room so we were taking pictures certainly as best we could and he wasn't Marlon Brando wasn't very warm and welcoming but he knew we were there from school college and when we left and we all took our film to get developed um we get them back and they're blank (laughs) so we feel somebody opened all of our because if you opened your camera with the film in it it ruined your film right and we think somebody on his staff had to have done that to our cameras we don't know but it, it, it is something i remember i know the folks of us that were there remember and it was a time in my life that I thought I was pretty cool. <laughs> so I'm and I didn't tell my father until after the fact. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. All right. So I'm curious because you mentioned about your dad and about, you made a very poignant point about you know, him growing up and there's white fountains and black fountains, but nothing for native Americans. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, during the sixties and so on, I mean, as, as a native American, did you sort of feel sort of like that, that maybe you were you were sort of being left out of this picture because obviously, you know, the dynamic during that time period, obviously you know, almost, uh, you know, for the last hundred plus years has been this whole black white dynamic. And obviously the Native right. American narrative has been really lost, displaced. In the story. Totally. So I'm curious in the sixties with everything that was going on during the civil rights movement, how did you sort of feel where your place was, Vicki? I truly, to be honest with you, didn't feel um, how folks must feel today, what they've been going through, truly. And the, the, you know, the mascot issues and so forth. Back then, where I felt a prejudice truly was when my father and mother would take us to Tennessee um, to visit my grandparents. and. They were warm and loving, but we'd go to the pool and the pool was really, I think, for white people, because I don't ever recall seeing any 
black people at the pool, but us three kids grew up in Southern California going to the beach and I'm in the sun for a day and I'm already tan and I, you know, black. And I had the feeling that the kids in the pool thought we were black Hmm. because our mother was blonde. So they couldn't quite figure out who are those three kids Mm with that lady. And we call her mom, of course. So I didn't really care much for going to Tennessee. I truly believe to the day my grandparents on my mom's side passed that they were prejudiced and used some of the words we're not supposed to use growing up. And I think my mother felt that and wanted to be in a community like we were in in Southern California. She embraced no matter who it was, uh, learn to cook the best dishes that one could have from the reservation from my aunties. It, it was um, no, I didn't feel any uh, hatred or discomfort when I was home. But when I went to Tennessee, I was never comfortable. So as we got older, we truly didn't go visit much. And when my grandfather passed, it was funny. My grandmother decided to come live with my parents for a couple of years. Mm. And that was a shock. So okay. maybe she saw the light at the end of her, her life. Mm. I don't know. But Okay. No, so then so you, you graduate, you go into graduate school, your your idea is, is to be a teacher. Um <laughs> Tell me then how that sort of transitioned into you had a very active role in the in the federal government in terms of Native American education and uh, awareness and things of that nature. So how, how did you sort of how did you make that leap after graduate school into the uh, federal government? Well, <clears throat> my father, um, who wasn't really a political uh, individual. You know, he, like I said, he liked you or didn't like you. Same with the people he voted for. It wasn't necessarily a Republican or a Democrat. Mm. It was who's going to do the right job. And at the time, Reagan was governor. And my father was a big supporter because my father was also the type of individual for the tribe. We need to be self-sufficient. We need to be fiscally responsible. We need to see less government intrusion and so forth. And he felt that was the direction to go and that the governor was going to get us there. Okay. And and that's when the tribes were finally being recognized in California. I don't know if you know this, there's over a hundred federally recognized tribes in the state of California now. Okay. And back then there were probably uh not it, federally recognized, but came up about in the late 50s, early 60s, and so on to this day. And that's people that have lived there their entire life don't even know that. Mm, yeah. So then Reagan obviously ran for president. Um, and when he won, well, when he was running, my father said, you should get involved. So I got involved in the campaign a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of changed my activism to a little more conservatism <laughs> um, in the years, but I did um, help and uh, applied for one of the political positions. And I got interviewed uh, by the White House to, to serve at the Department of Education. Back then, you literally interviewed at the White House to go to one of the federal entities where today they they do it by federal entities, not you don't go to the White House. Right. And um, I got assigned to the Department of Education. And I made a commitment to go for one year. That's all I was going, going back to California, going to continue teaching that I loved. But, you know, here I am. <laughs> I'm, te I'm 10 years later and uh, have a family now. And I loved um working as a public servant. I, I have to tell you, I've done some fabulous assignments. Um, I've got to travel mm -hmm. all over the world. Um, I, I, I didn't start my family till in my 40s. So um, I had a, a, a good run. And uh, once 
I had my daughter, my, the husband. I decided, you know, this is home, even though I still call California home and he gets upset with me. But, um, you know, our daughter's an East Coast girl, but um, I do go back and forth. We're all going to California for Christmas to be okay, with other relatives. So then t- tell me then about, you talk about some of the assignments that you had. Uh, during, when you look back on it, Vicki, what were the some, well, one, what was the most interesting or fascinating? And two, was there one in terms of importance in terms of Native Americans that you really were very pleased with, that you, with the outcomes? I'd have to say there's a couple um, in, in my political world. Um, the obvious is all the work I got to do for Indian education, for Indian energy. I worked at the Department of Energy where I got to help um, bring a presence. The tribes were never included in the process back then when they were making decisions of transporting spent fuel or hazardous waste. When many of our tribes fell in those communities, Mm -hmm. they were helping the states and the local governments, but they were forgetting our tribal governments. And all we wanted back then was to bring the tribes to the table before decisions were made. And I am very proud I was helpful in that process back uh, at the Department of Energy, Mm -hmm. Department of Education. I was so fortunate to do uh, the Office of Indian Education, not only as an employee, as a special assistant or program assistant, I forget what they were called, way early on. But later in my career, I got to be head of that office. So that was very fortunate. And we were able to elevate it to the highest level. But one other area that I got to do very early on was um, the AIDS Commission. And um, that's where I met Admiral Watkins, Admiral James Watkins, who had just left the military after 40 some years. And he became the chairman. And I met him uh, to, through a, a mutual friend that asked me, well, you know, we really need someone like you, Vicki, to come and do the scheduling and logistics for the commissioners. And, and it's a serious issue. I had a lot of gay friends. And I thought, well, maybe before I go back to California, this would be something um, I can contribute to and, and feel like, you know, I'm helping. And I, uh, once I did the AIDS commission, met the admiral and all the other commissioners, um, it was difficult to leave. So I stayed with Admiral Watkins when he went to the Department of Energy and was his scheduler and logistics person uh, again. So I was eight years four with him under Reagan, four with him under Bush 41. And then uh, after that, uh, the Clinton administration asked me to stay on. So I did. And okay. I was able to transition to the um, Democrat side, not being a Democrat, they appreciated the work that I did. So I was very pleased and loved working. Yeah. For Hazel O'Leary. Hazel O'Leary was the first um, black woman uh, to become Secretary of Energy. Yes. Um, she was no, a delight no. to work yeah, for. That's fantastic. Now, thank you. Thank you, Vicki. So I'm, I'm curious, because, um, you know, initially you talked about, you enlightened me that there were 100 registered tribes in California. Now, when you're in the Department of Education and the Department of Energy, obviously you're overseeing, uh, your interests are Native Americans all across the country. So tell me, number one, uh, do you know h- how many registered tr- tribes are there in the country? Do you know? Um, it's it's about 580 federally recognized okay. tribes. They're not called registered. They're federally recognized. recognized. That means the federal government has recognized them as an entity. And they're sovereign nations. All of those sovereign nations are within a nation. So that's where a lot of our problems begin. And those tribes um, are all over the country. And, and, and we've got um, Alaska Native corporations that are representative of our Alaska Native um, villages. But it, it, the number, you know, I'd say is you're safe about 580. It, okay. it might be a little higher, might be a tad lower. I can't recall. But you get the recognition Basically, if you have a land base, like 
I'm sure you're familiar in North Carolina, our Lumbee tribe, they've been fighting for years to get federal recognition. And I think it's, it's, it's on the docket again with Congress to take up. I mean, it's been fought, you know, my lifetime uh, for that recognition, but it's hard for them to find that land base is their issue. But okay, no, um, yeah. now I'd like to get into that a little bit more, but I did want to ask since we're just talking about this. So the Department of Education, Department of Energy, you know, 580 um, tribes. tribes across the country. Was there obviously not everything is created equal? So, in terms of trying to represent. Uh, and try to do the best for various tribes across the country. What did you see? What were some of the difficulties, if any, in terms of uh, you know what what's pressing for one tribe versus another? And that's important. We uh, there you can't say. Uh, as a matter of fact, just within our twenty or so tribes in San Diego County, even though we're all you know native, we're all different. Mm -hmm. What they're doing at San Pasquale and what they're doing at uh, Pachanga or, uh, you know, uh, Agua Caliente or some of the others in San Diego County, is it's all different. We all have different assets, uh, different leadership, um, different fights that we're fighting within, um, even within your own tribe, there's competition and who's got what and who doesn't have. Mm -hmm. So you put that just in one tribe and then you've got them all over the nation. And what they do in the Northwest versus the Southwest is completely different. Mm -hmm. uh, the East Coast to the Midwest. Um, and I think that's why we don't have just one to identify with to fight the fight. And uh, we're all fighting our fights um, separately. So Unfortunately, yeah. So I'm curious, you know, as as a Black American, you know, again, every every race culture has its diversities, right? But sometimes, a lot of times, we are lumped as one. So we're just Black people. So in yeah. terms of when you were at the Department of Education or Department of Energy, you know, did you get a sense that Native Americans were sort of lumped as one? And then how did you try to figure out how do I sort of educate the people that I'm working with to say? This is not the case. Well, I have to say today they are doing a great job in this administration. With They just held literally uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, maybe it was Monday. And Tuesday. Tuesday and Wednesday was the um, National Tribal Summit. Okay. And all of those that wanted to be a participant were able to participate. And it was two full days. The president spoke. Uh, the vice president spoke. First Lady spoke, Deb Holland, several other cabinet members. It was um, on all the issues. Tribal leaders tro spoke. Mm -hmm. but back then, it, it was really kind of the beginning of getting our tribal leadership uh, to speak up and to be included in the process. Mm -hmm. When decisions were made um, that were going to affect the reservation land or the tribal community, um, or there was a lack of federal services, uh, we, we at the Department of Ed and at the Energy Department, we would, before the you know, ink was dry, we'd get the pencil, the eraser, and work with them hand in hand so that both sides agreed on what the decision was that was mm -hmm. made. And um, that was a, it was hard. It was yeah. really hard. Today, they now have, like at the Department of Energy, an Indian Energy Office with its own funding, legislated by Congress. They came a long way. I was, I think, put in the, what was it called? The Office of like Congressional and Intergovernmental Affairs, which the tribes didn't agree. You know, they were their, their sovereign nations. Yes. They're not just a, you know, an intergovernmental affair entity yes and they wanted to be a part just like the state governments were or just like our federal government and we 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 did that and so today fast forward you see an office of indian energy an office of indian education and the office of indian education versus 
at the Bureau of Indian Education, which, which falls under Interior, um, the Office of Indian Education funds the public schools across our nation that have Native students in their schools, where the BIE schools, the Bureau of Indian Education schools, are our Native kids on the, the reservations or in the Bureau schools. And so that's a different funding process. But it was... It was great to see, you know, in our public schools that they are supporting our Native kids that are more urban um, or from the communities that aren't on the reservation. No, well, th thank you, Vicki, for that. So then you, you have, you're a teacher, you join part school. of the administrations, three administrations. Uh, how does that then lead to tribal tech? Good question. Here's another story. <laughs> After working for the federal government, I was very fortunate to um, retire with a little uh, retirement. And I put that away and I get a check every month. And fortunately, my husband was very supportive. I have to give some accolades to him, even though I'm, I'm selective. <laughs> but <laughs> he, I have to give him some credit. Um, but I uh, actually decided to run for office mm. locally for the 45th district of um, Virginia. And be it right or wrong, if you put a D on your big placards and handouts, most likely, most likely in our community, you will get elected. If you put an R, most likely you won't. Northern Virginia is pretty, pretty blue. I thought I was an R. So I, I didn't put an R on anything. I went door to door. I felt like that was most important was to meet the people. I'd never done anything political per se, other than, you know, support Reagan when he ran. Had Wait, what year was this, Vicki? When I ran for office? Yes. I think it was 2000. Um, it was the 10, 2000, and, what, what year are we in? 2010, 2010, 9 or 10. It was when, um, what's his name? Uh, he was a Republican. Um, Bob McDonald. Is that okay. his name? Which was, um, he got um, elected as a Republican um, governor. And we had um, one uh, Republican on our city council in Alexandria, Virginia, as well, get elected. And so I really thought maybe I could do it, too. Um, it's a blessing that I didn't actually get in because I would not have been able to do what I do now. And Oh, it's, it's just been a godsend. But I truly ran and knocked door to door. And I would talk to the people and we would agree on education. We'd Because um, Obama was running for president and he really was a big promotion promoter of charter schools, which I would loved charter schools and some of our Indian programs did too. Um, the, the infrastructure in this area was off to the races on building and transportation, what we're mm -hmm. gonna do. So I would talk to the people and they agreed. Well, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And I kind of, oh, Republican, you know, kind of like try not to say it too loud. So I did really well considering because most people, and I even watched this go around just to see how the Republican did. And I think it was 29 to something. I was 40 to 60. But um, he, the gentleman I ran against was an incumbent. Um, he spent over $200,000. I can't. I, I can't do that. Uh, money has to go to education, health and wealth, you know, wellness, not running a camp. I wish we didn't have anybody that would spend all that money on this, these races today. But I blocked 50,000. I said, that's it to pay for all these signs and all this other hoopla. And so maybe if I'd spent more, I don't know. <laughs> but I worked that hard. That's when I made the decision. You know what? I'm going to start my own business. And I applied for the Small Business Administration 8A program. And it was unheard of. I got certified in 30 days. 
for that 8A wow. program. People told me it'd take a year and I was ready, you know, and 30 days. And then I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but um, I was very fortunate to get on a subcontract with someone who helped get me uh, springboard into the uh, government contracting world. And okay. uh, here I am today. Started with one employee. Uh, probably it's been maybe 12 years, 10 10 to 12 years ago. And now I have about 150 employees. Wow. And I um, had a couple hundred thousand and we're probably going to close out at about 25, 26 million this year. Um, And I acquired another company, uh, a defense contractor in 2019. So we're working hard, but that's the secret though. Go work hard. And I, I can't sleep at night unless I know every, all my I's are dotted, all my T's are crossed, my people are happy. Um, it's hard yeah. to let go. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. So tell me then, what, tell me about Tribal Tech. What, what, what do you do? Maybe? Well, um, the good news is um, I'm now the, uh, I've changed my title to owner and chairwoman. Uh, earlier this year, I hired a CEO and president, she's one and the same, who is fabulous. So my responsibilities currently are a little less. Um, I'm, I'm not ready to give it all away or, or, or give it up, but um, I don't have that stress that I had mm-hmm. every day uh, of running the day-to-day operations. But what we do at Tribal Tech is many things, but obviously because of my background and the contracts that we've received for years has mostly been to help those Indian communities, be it in education, energy, labor. Uh, We do work for the Substance Abuse Mental Health Service Administration, which is sad that we have to do that work today in the 21st century, but I'm grateful and thankful we get to do that work. And that is suicide, drugs, alcohol, opioids, domestic abuse, bullying, now COVID, um, the missing and murdered women and children, uh, the trafficking, all that. We are very fortunate to get to do that work because that is in our Native communities. I have subject matter experts that are Native and love what they do, have a passion for what they do. And um, when you're out there, you, you feel like you've really made a difference in some respect. So uh, the education work that we do is through the Department of Education and through the Bureau of Indian Education. Department of Energy, we work for the Office of Indian Energy. Department of Labor, we work for them. Um, We do some fun work. Uh, uh, The OPM, the Office of Personnel Management, uh, has taken over the uh, combined federal campaign which, gosh, it's been going on for 50 years, if not more. Um, And we've won some of their contracts uh, to help uh, fundraise, where as the federal employees can give to charities, we help organize that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's That's different. Yes. Yeah. And are your programs, they're all across the United States, or they? Well, all the... All the funding is from the federal government on these contracts, but they require us to work all across the United States, uh, depending on what the need is um, or what the service is. Uh, our, some of our employees literally before COVID um, worked in the federal buildings okay. um, to do grant management, staff assistance, uh, technical assistance, event planning. You know, some of that has changed because we've all gone virtual and they haven't come back into government yet. Okay. But um, we, we as a government contractor have been required uh, to, to assure that all of our employees have been vaccinated. And that was due December 8th, but it's been extended till January. And all but three of our employees are vaccinated, which is amazing. Yes, yes. And they have issues which we will work with them on but um i I was surprised that we had such a good participation 
uh, whether you believe or don't believe, um, it's a health crisis. <laughs> so, um, and it's certainly in our communities. Um, so I was very proud of our employees. For yes, no, that, that's, that's terrific. Up. Yes, yes. So let me ask you this. I mean, so from going from one employee to 160 in about 11, 12 years, tell me, and you talk about hard work, and I, I believe in hard work too, but as we know, hard work doesn't always get you to where you want to go. And there are a variety of other factors as well. But so tell me, when you started this business, how did you make it grow? I mean, what was what are some of the key elements uh, in your success in this phenomenal growth um, that your company has incurred? Well, first off, um, the the it wasn't as simple as maybe I've made it sound. Um, I did have someone I trusted in and was a, a mentor, not formally, and that is the individual that helped me get my first subcontract. Okay. Um, with that. You have to be 100% or more uh, on the job and doing a good job in order for the government to continue your work. Okay. And I was very fortunate they recognized the work we did as a sub that they asked us to become the prime. And so we flipped. And fortunately, that individual said, you know, go ahead. Take the contract, just put one or two of us on as a sub on our company, which I did. I'm going along receiving, you know, more and more uh, contracts. Again, you have to submit a proposal. You have to have costing and technical. And some, some wanted native people. I had good people that I put forward on these proposals and fortunately be selected. However, I was pretty dependent on this individual helping guide me. Okay. And I had met him in the federal government years ago. And that individual actually convinced me to do, and I was still small, my back office support through him in Colorado, because that's where he was based. And I was based in the DC area. And that means all my IT, all my accounting, all my business development, uh, HR, you know, personnel, mm -hmm. all those back office support issues. I couldn't afford to have people doing that. I'm doing a lot of this. I had a small number back then. If you mm -hmm. recall, I said we started small. Right. Well, I, I come into the office one day, uh, having been out for a week, I think, on travel, and I have a new employee. And that person says, hi, I'm your new recruiter. My name is, you know, I'm going to just say John Smith. Oh, great. Good to meet you, John. Um, what are we recruiting for? And I tried not to act like I didn't know, but I didn't know. And he says, well, we're opening an office in San Antonio to work for the Army Corps. Oh, yeah, that's right. I didn't know. So he must have seen. I look like deers in the headlights, you know, what? He came back that evening and he said, you know, I want to show you something. So he pulls out this email and it says, please do not discuss this with Vicki, Fabrice, or Joanne. Fabrice is my husband. Joanne is my right hand. And I just went, huh, thank you very much. From that day on, I pulled together a handful of people. I'm talking no money. They just came and helped me in 30 days, pull everything out of Colorado back here. And then I fired my friend's son, who was going to be my president, got rid of all that support. The only area we really lost was the IT because I spent a lot of money to build up their IT versus mine, but I started over and I go I, and, and I go to find out that the individual, John Smith, quote unquote, was building another company on my dime. And he had since done that to other women 
and was ready to do another woman who met with me and said, well, what do you think about John Smith? And I had to tell her, honestly, get out. Don't go there. And to this day, she's like this as well. I went like this as well. And it taught me a lesson. Nobody. I am 100% engaged in this company to the day I die or it goes under or it sells. And, it, and I'm glad I learned that lesson early. And I attribute trust but verify to Reagan. I don't know if that really was his saying, but he said it many times. I say it all the time. I said it the other day to on the panel. I said, you all have to trust but verify one of the first things you need to do to grow your company because yeah. you don't know. And some people even say, well, you hire your family. or Yeah, I, my husband is going to be brutally honest. And sometimes I don't want to hear it. He's also going to tell me the numbers if I'm questioning the numbers. But I'm not necessarily bringing in the whole family. Right. You know, because you have ish- family issues, too, that you might not trust. Right. So that's, no, th- that's yeah. a big lesson I learned. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. once I took control, I grew that company very carefully and very thoughtfully and with people I did trust and verify. No, and another no. uh, later in, in, in my success, I was able to acquire a small defense company to do something in a whole nother um, lane. And uh, that obviously acquisition is all obviously a quick way um, versus us trying to go for defense contracts through tribal tech, we we are we already went, we had it done and so forth. It wasn't easy. Yeah. It still isn't easy. But because uh, I wasn't from that culture and uh, culture became another issue. And I'm not talking the native culture, just two companies that were complete opposites and trying to make them one uh, was a yes. difficult challenge. Yeah. So I'm curious because I was going to ask you <laughs> about your mentors and champions. So you you had a mentor who turned out to be not a not mentor. a champion, <laughs> not a champion. But Never was, spoke was, to him again. Wow. It, but was there any after that period, Vicky? Was there anyone else that sort of um, sort of championed your cause? Um, my people in my organization. I'm serious. Um, hey, Vic, I see an opportunity at such and such. Let's go for it. I mean, I have the greatest people working in this company. I, I can't say that enough. And I know I get the accolades or I get the awards, which, you know, thank, thankfully, the 100 Black men from the greater Washington, D.C. area and WPO partnered and recognized me. I, I was deeply honored. But it's not just Vicky. I am... And they always say, don't, you know, you need to accept your success. Yeah, I do. But I truly have a, a, a group of individuals that work for our company and support me. Uh, we have our ups and downs. We feel comfortable to agree, to disagree. Um, but almost everything is done in a, in a unified voice, not just Vicki Vasquez. And I know I'm a tough cookie and they all see me coming and they're like, oh no, she's going to read the proposal because that school teacher comes out in me and I'm like, all right, are those eyes dotted, are those T's crossed? But um, no, no. Those, yeah. that's once I had that, uh, that awful experience, I, I rather have my experience with the people. I have my, my mantras, people, performance and partnerships. And I believe that it's the people, it's your performance, and it's those partnerships. Yes. And I love partnerships, whether I partner with someone to go after work and we get one job, that's great. And one job is better than no job for somebody. So yeah. um, no, if you no, live by that, it helps. So let me ask you this. Obviously, you've had wonderful, tremendous success. Tell me. Knock on wood. <laughs> knock on wood. Knock on wood. Uh, and all that hard work. As a woman and as a Native American, what challenges, if any, uh, have you sort of had to overcome to reach this pinnacle, Vicki? 
I, I, I don't disrespect anyone that's older, but I think it's my age. I may not look my age. I thank my father for that. But I wish I, and I said this the other day, I wish I would have started sooner. Um, I'm a lot older than you probably think I am, but um, that is probably something I, I just, I know my husband thinks I'm the energizer bunny, but you do have a little more aches and pains. You might not have that uh, quickness or stamina that you might've had 10 years ago, 20 years ago, but I, I don't regret uh, starting later. I don't regret all that public service that I was fortunate to serve. I, I just wish now, um, that's why I have a new CEO and president. I just needed to kind of take a deep breath and the second thing would be, um, uh, I didn't have my daughter till I was 42. So um, I don't want to miss all that. Yeah. And I, 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 when you're working 24 seven, you do miss some of that. So now, you know, she's in school, and I'm back and forth to New York, and I'm able to do that. So, okay, I guess that's my challenge <laughs> well, yeah, but, but in terms of then in terms of being a woman and a native american no no issues throughout your career then because it, it, that's a good question but because of the work that we do and the federal government does and there's very few women owned native owned businesses okay so uh and we have partnered with other women that are native and we we've, we've all rocked and gone forward. But I think that's where I have a specialty and they know it. I did a lot of native work myself personally, but almost, you know, the majority of our work is in that area. So I think that was our advantage. Um, I haven't really seen good or bad on the defense side, but I would love to go and help do some of the same work we do for the reservations and for the uh, civilian side and the military side because they have addiction may not be the same addictions they have suicide they have health and wellness issues and i'd love to do that for the military as well and we're just making those relationships now i had the relationships on the native side but um, i really see there's a need in those communities no you know, thank you vicky so we're, we're this is a part of native american history month and national no. native american heritage month yeah, yes we're about midway through what's yeah. today the 17th perfect timing yes so tell me i want to get historical here for a moment if we if we could okay tell me about what you see uh the the importance of of, of native americans its historical importance you know what has happened to native americans since the arrival of the Europeans, you know, what do young people in particular need to know about our history, Native American history, and, and its relevance and importance? Well, being that it's um, Native American Heritage Month, obviously, for you, when, when I mentioned there's over 580 or somewhere in that number, federally recognized tribes, that's 580 sovereign nations that have had to fought to be recognized uh, in this country that have been uh, tried to be assimilated, have been moved off of their land and been able to reclaim what they can. Today, to see where these young students are on the reservation, getting educated and coming back and serving or coming back and making some of these. I mean, look at Deb Holland. She's Secretary of Interior, not just, uh, and not that I'm lessening the importance of Indian Affairs, but she's not the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. She's the Secretary of Interior. We have a Native person in the uh, Bureau of Land Management heading that up. Um, you know, we, the National Park Service, he, I don't know if he's, he went through his nomination process, but, you know, those are huge positions for Native people to be in now, um, where we haven't had that presence. 
Um, so that's important to recognize. Uh, the culture, you know, we are not walking around with headdresses and our robes and our jewelry. I mean, yes, I'm wearing a nice piece of jewelry today, but, you know, we're not out there every day. We dress like you do. You dress like I do. But there is a reason what we do recognize our culture and and we do go to powwows and we do um, beadwork and, and so forth, but it's all part of what we've learned and, and, and grown, but not something that's a TV ad or um, a mascot or what have you. Um, so it's important to, to recognize we all have different cultures. And like I said, in the very, very beginning of our conversation, you either like the person or you don't. That's what we should look at, not the color or because they wear glasses, or because they're fat or skinny or smart or, or maybe not as educated. You, you, you just, you, you get along. And that's what I learned uh, growing up with my father. And um, I'm so thankful that I've taught my daughter that I, I loved growing up uh, watching her grow up with her friends and um, here on the East Coast in a, a pretty middle class area, uh, saying, you know, you know, the girl that um, she's in our second grade class and she wears the glasses and she, well, and that girl was African American. She didn't say, oh, she's black, like you'd know. She just, you know, the one with the glasses or. So I love that when I hear kids describe someone more about, oh, the one that's in the pink sweater, not the Indian over there. Well, I'm I'm curious, though, and and, and that's wonderful. And I I think uh, that that's fantastic. All these positive things have have happened. But I'm curious, how do you sort of reconcile? You know, I'm I'm, right now I'm in Williamsburg, Virginia. And when the Europe English arrived in 1607, the Powhatan were the largest tribe, excuse me, on the East Coast, Algonquins. And within, by the end of the century, they were gone. They had been exterminated. All right. So, and that that happened to many Native American tribes. Across and, the nation. You know, so I, what's that? Across the nation. Yes, You're across correct. the nation. So I, that point, you know, so, so few people know anything about that early history and right. the trials and tribulations of Native American tribes across the country. How do we educate our young people more about those kinds of things? Because, you know, as a parent who's been here in Virginia, you know, the Powhatan Native American history is virtually, it's not taught at all um, in, in the school books. So it's, you know, how do we, we have all these positive things that are happening. Um, obviously, I, and I do want to talk just briefly about some of the issues, you know, some of the concerning issues on the, on the reservations, but how do we sort of talk about that early history and the impact it has made on America? A couple things um, that I think is important that any of the students can Google. And I have a dear friend, her father was a coach. He, he's, he's 93, still alive today, but we can look at the history, go back to our military, go back to the days when we were fighting World War I and World War II. Our Native American folks from the Navajo the Diné people came and helped with, they're called the code, code, code talkers, sure. the Navajo code talkers. And I think there's only four individuals that are still alive today. That's a good history lesson. It may, I don't know if it's in the history books all across the nation. I'm sure it's in some, but it certainly has become forefront People now talk about it during Native American Heritage Month. They have been invited, been invited almost during any veterans ceremony. We get our living code talkers and come forward. Uh, Peter McDonald was just here in the D.C. area during the veterans work that was being recognized. But that's one area. I can't speak for all the um, tribes across the country, they're all different. But I can tell you if someone wants to learn one thing, learn about that, because that's our history. That's our nation, be it Indian or not, they helped us get through those wars. Secondly, (coughs) excuse me, being in the Williamsburg area. And and again, I don't know if it's in the history books today, because it's fairly new. 
in the past, I don't know, four years now. How I, I can't. Again, I'm aging, um, but the, there's six or seven of the tribes of your area that have been finally federally recognized by the government um, as uh, tribes. Yes. So that I can't imagine isn't coming forth to the uh, history books. Um, I know you can go to uh, what is it? The Jamestown Foundation. There's a a place you can go and visit and they will teach you now the latest of the tribes uh, that are recognized. Same, the National Museum of the American Indian, which the Native folks fought for for years to get that land. We had to raise a lot of money, Congress, you know, to match Congress and so forth. But you you go through there, you're going to see all the different tribes as well as other indigenous people um, throughout that museum. Um, So for me, I'm not the expert and I certainly don't want to claim to be, but I would have folks during Native American Heritage Month go to the museum, uh, go to Williamsburg and visit the Jamestown uh, Center. I I can't think of the name of it. Yes. Yes. James but it's Foundation. a little history lesson there True. that's yeah. taught thoughtfully and it and it shows you from you know from back in the day to current uh same at the museum uh in dc um new york has a museum as well i know they just opened one in oklahoma uh as well so it, it, it's sad because not only our history many histories i think were um expressed wrongfully throughout our history books. And I hope today our young folks can change that and correct that. Um, yes. That's where we, we see that happening, I think, with our, our kids today getting educated and coming back and that's their dissertation or that's their their um, contribution. Yes. They're going to make change. We hope that continues. No, thank you, Vicki, for that. And just sort of finally, you, you had talked about some of the issues that were on reservations, on the reservations, you know, alcoholism, suicide, unemployment. Um, how do we how do we make things better on reservations across the country, Vicki? I wish I had that answer. <laughs> I would love to. I'd be a millionaire probably if I could give that answer. But um, the good news is. Um, there, there is change and folks are really smart and they're doing the right things, but there is poverty. There is um, statistics that'll show you the numbers of, of uh, uneducated, the numbers uh, when you compare the drug use and one uh, set of numbers to the native numbers. Those are real. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the hardest is when you see in the suicides which especially during these last couple of years, folks, it, it's been high across the nation for all people. But for the Native people, you get four or five young individuals, and I'm talking 12 years old, 16, they'll make a pack and they'll say, if, if you do it, I'll do it. Well, if you do it, I'll do it. And yeah. we got four suicides yeah. that were done together. We got to go heal that Indian community. We got to go help that Indian community and help them understand that the children understand that that's not the answer. Um, And we've got a very culturally related way to do that with our, our subject matter experts that get called to those communities. So there is the problems. I am, the the type of person I love to look at, what are our successes? Mm -hmm. One of the successes we had during COVID was certainly not the testing, but the vaccines became a a success. They were able to bring those statistics up quickly, unlike some of the other communities that were non-native. For whatever reason, we were able to get the vaccines quicker and out there to our people. When it was during the testing time in the beginning, we couldn't get COVID tests to the Indian communities. So I look at the positive there. 
um, I, I look at the positive in, in, in education and the appointments that some of our Native people are, are getting. And yes. they grew up with very little and, and look where they are today. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not saying I'm blind to the, the issues. They're there. Certainly during COVID when, when all the kids were sent home, well, our kids were sent home 50 miles away. <laughs> they didn't have Wi-Fi and a computer and an iPad and an iPhone for that matter. So we, those issues were brought to the forefront. We've seen a lot of help come our way, uh, which is good. So it, it and, you know. Yes. So, you know, successes, good. a lot of successes, but still a lot of work to do. Yep. Yep. Because those communities are still very rural. Uh, um, you know, I don't want to say remote. I feel like remote, you're not there. So I always say very rural still today. A lot of needs, broadband, electricity, yeah. heating, <laughs> water. Yeah. Basic issues. issues. Yeah. Basic issues. Yeah. Yeah. But we've got such good people now that are getting put in office on our, our tribal councils and fighting the right fight. Um, sometimes, you know, folks see the casinos or the hotels as a negative, but it brought a lot of jobs and it brought resources. And now they're, some of those tribes are off to the races on mm -hmm. economic development in whole different areas that we never would have had the opportunity to do. No, well, thank you, Vicki, for sharing that. And it's, uh, no, it's, it's been an absolute delight to get a chance to chat with you and your, your phenomenal success and your, your service to this country. Um, and, you know, your insights into where we are uh, it has been wonderful. It's uh, greatly, greatly appreciated. Um, maybe at some other point, I could uh, pick your brain on some other issues as well. Sure, I'll try. As long as <laughs> And like I said, I'm aging. I don't know where the brain's going to go <laughs> next year. <laughs> I'm just trying to get through Thanksgiving and Christmas. <laughs> it's well, no. come too fast. Yeah, All no, time. no. I, I understand it does. It's uh, it, it's time does fly. It does go yeah. very, very quickly. But uh, no, again, you, you've had a, such a, a phenomenal career. And it's, it's wonderful yeah. to get a chance to talk about that and, you know, sh Thank share you. these stories with with young people. Um, so they can aspire to be uh, someone like you. So thank you. And I'm telling you, if I can do it, anyone can do it. Truly. <laughs> no. Got to work hard, though. <laughs> That's what you and know. Have, you, a passion. You, have a passion for what you do yeah. and you can't lose. Yeah, well, okay, that's the last thing I'll ask you. Uh, la last advice for young people uh, to, ma to make their own dreams come true. What do they have to do? What if, do they if, if you really enjoy whatever it is, and you have that passion, go for it. I've had a passion for education for very young in life, all the way, and I'm still with that passion. Now all these other entities have come along, but go for it. Really, take that risk. Just do it earlier than I did. <laughs> well, take the risk, go after your dreams, and work hard. That That's... That's what That's you're saying. This is the Black Experience for all. If you like what you hear at the Black Experience, please consider clicking on the join button to support our nonprofit. I'm Adam P. Kennedy. Thank you for joining us.